Um, hello, good morning. Uh, we are here today to talk about how to find 50,000 needles in 5 million haystacks. Um, this talk is going to be about a combination of uh, network traffic analysis, threat hunting, and machine learning. So that's what you should expect to see here. Uh, bit, uh, before, we would like to introduce ourselves very briefly. I'm Veronica. I'm from Argentina. I'm a malware traffic uh, researcher and threat intel analyst and cognitive threat analytics, which is part of Cisco. I'm also a co-founder of the Maze Lab Hackerspace back in Buenos Aires. Uh, I'm here today with two of my colleagues, uh, Karel Bartosz, uh, he's from Czech Republic, a uh, network security researcher, and Lukas Machlitsa, uh, he's from Slovakia, and he's also doing <coughs> Uh, network security uh, research uh, in our group. So um, let's get started. Uh, we are, today we are living in very interesting times. Uh, our world is connected as never been before, right? Uh, from fridges to cars to anything. And this is very useful sometimes. And this, this connectivity is because sometimes we want it to be this way, right? And sometimes because we forgot to change the full password, uh, which is happens more often than we think. And we, we are facing unique challenges, uh, not only because of the new tricks, methods, and sophistication or lack of that malware authors are bringing to the table every week, every, every month, but also because of the scale of the attacks. Or organizations or, or users are one click away to get infected almost every, every single day. From malicious advertising to adware and phishing, phishing being the, be one of the biggest sources of infections nowadays, to more complex threats such as ransomware, that I'm sure you heard a lot this year, banking trojans, information stealers, remote access trojans, and so on. So this this means that the question that we ask ourselves has changed in the last couple of years. The question right now is not longer if an organization is going to be breached by one. It can happen this week, it can happen next year, right? The thing is how to be prepared against that. And if we assume that at some point we organizations are, are going to be breached, we are going to have active infections, right? then it's clear what we need to do, is basically look for these threats that already bypass all the security measures that we have in place. Because we have antiviruses, we have IDSs, we have all these, right? But what happens if there is something new that already uh, bypass the, these security measures and is on our network? So, uh, but this, this is basically the definition of threat hunting, uh, which Threat hunting assumes compromise, okay? They assume that you are already compromised and they have a series of methodologies and techniques to actually search for these threats on your network. That's what many companies do. But, and this is what I do, uh, big scale, for a living. So, uh, it's, my job is not actually quite like this. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to see the comparisons because in normal hunting, you actually know many things. You know the environment where you are going to hunt. You know your weapon. You know, and more importantly, you know your prey. You know what you are hunting for. You know how it looks like. You know the colors. You know the size. So you know if you have good chances or not. But in my job, uh, in many of your job, this is not like it. <laughs> because I don't know what I'm hunting for. In my network, I don't know where to start, and I'm looking for things that I already bypassed the antiviruses. I already bypassed all the signatures. I'm looking, I'm hunting for something completely unknown. So this is, this is how a uh, common network looks like, and when I have no idea what I'm looking for. And in my case, it's dozens or hundreds of different networks. So. Uh, what do we do here? It's, it's not actually true that I don't know anything. I'm not, I'm not 
truly hunting for the unknown because there are some things that we already know because we know how banking Trojans communicate, right? We know banking Trojans in general. We know that the goal is to steal credentials from the user. So they will, at some point, when they steal the credentials, they need to send them out, okay, to the attackers. If we have a remote access Trojan, the that piece of malware actually needs an active communication because it needs to be actually controlled by the attacker. If we have exfiltration trojans, it's actually the same. Click fraud, it's actually the same. So there is one thing that they have in common, and that is the need to communicate through the network. And there is where we can take this need to communicate, exploit it to make it our competitive advantage. And this is what we do. But the, the problem, the next problem is like the sizes of our networks. We are talking about every user in an organization has three, four, five, six devices. So it's no longer that our network is hundreds of devices. It's that multiplied for five, right? So we are consuming, we are talking about a lot of data. But wait, big data is no longer a problem, not a challenge anymore. We know how to work with big data, we have the software, we have the storage, right? This is, this is not a matter of discussion anymore. And the problem now, the next problem is, I cannot replace humans, right? Because the threat expert is, knows where to look at, knows if they, they are looking at the network. If I'm looking at the network, I know which things are interesting. I know, I can tell, okay, this piece of uh, proxy log, it, seems very suspicious to me. And can we, how can we do that? And here is where machine learning comes to place. Because what if we can teach machine learning to actually see through my eyes? What if we can teach the algorithms to see specific features that I, as a threat analyst, I would, I would look at? So um, this talk is about, it's going to be about this. Um, because machine learning, we, Combining these three things, we can go from this picture to actually something more like this, where we cannot longer sit on a network and say, I don't know where to look at. We can have things, specific things pointed, us, pointed to us saying, okay, instead of looking at everything, look at this specific group of interesting things. And not only that, but also look at these things that so, seem similar together. So if we have one infection, it may not mean anything, but if you have three infections, then you have more information to correlate, right? So this talk is going to be about combining these three things. We are not going to present a novel revolutionary machine learning algorithm, but we are here today because we want to share our experience on how we, how we combine this, because it feels like every day I wake up and read the news, it seems that it's, it's so depressing. <laughs> it's like all the same, right? And we seems like as defenders, we are always one step behind. So how do we position ourselves one step ahead of the game? And that the answer is not secrecy, right? And we believe in transparency and collaboration. And we think that if we tell, uh, explain how we work, what uh, successes we had, we can take this uh, step forward. And in, we combine these three things in a real life implementation. Um, we face, in the way, we face different challenges. And my colleague Karel is going to walk you uh, through those challenges. Thank you, Veronica. So we, as uh, network security researchers, are facing four major challenges that we believe prevent machine learning from being successfully and massively used in practice. And a few years back, addressing those challenges would seem basically like a Star Wars. But in the following 40 minutes, we are going to show you our solutions to those challenges and that it's not such a Star Wars anymore. So the first challenge is high dynamics of malware. Network environment is highly dynamic and malware samples and malicious traffic is dynamic even more because attackers are trying everything that they can and change everything that they can to bypass the current security systems and to remain invisible. 
The other challenge is the lack of labels. Uh, to build a successful and reliable and precise classification systems, we need a lot of labels. And in network security, this is a big problem. And what's even more troubling is that obtaining additional labels is also very costly and very painful process. Another challenge is large scale training. To make the classifiers work on different companies and in dif on different networks, we need the ability to train the classifiers from big data. And the last challenge is actually how to automate all these things, how to retrain the classifiers automatically from the data to react on the ever-changing network threat landscape. So this scheme summarizes the four challenges that we will be talking about today and I will be talking about the first two and how we how we uh, succeeded in here and Lukáš will be talking about the other two. So let's start with malware dynamics. So attackers change malicious code or payload on daily basis to bypass the signatures based systems, right? And instead of doing the static analysis, we decided to explore another, uh, let's say, feature or need what the malware traffic does and that is the need to communicate over network. So for that, we are using metadata, more specifically proxy log records, that is an information acquired from the header of the packets and it has information about who is communicating with whom and how much and when, but we don't see the content of the communication, which us also mm, makes us uh, HTTPS agnostic. So when working with this, when, with, with this data, uh, this gives us an opportunity to be invariant against all of the malicious code or payload changes, right? But the attackers do a lot of other things a lot of other changes that we need to consider. And that includes the change of server IP addresses or host names to bypass the blacklists or feeds. Or they change thinking time or U URL resources or parameters to bypass anomaly detection systems or other behavior analytics. So to tackle this problem, we need to build an invariant representation that would be robust and invariant against all of these changes. And I will be talking about it right now. So the first step is to extract some basic features. We are using two types of features. The first type is, are the features extracted from the individual connections, from the individual requests or flows. And they can be URL based, for example, uh, you can extract Ngram statistics to detect DGAs or you can extract some distribution of special characters to detect, let's say, tunneling data through URL and we have also other fields at disposal. For example, the number of uh, bytes transferred up and down or HTTP status, referrer, mind type, user agent and so on. So you can extract hundreds of features out of these fields. Another type of features besides that are the features computed from the global visibility because we have that so we can actually compute features like uh, let's say user domain popularity or the popularity of, of the server IPs or the popularity of hashes and we can also ex use some external sources like who is to, to work with the age of the domain. But it's not that simple because if we just would extract all the features and put it into the classifier, it will not work because, because of this. Here you can see 32 different malware categories, that are the rows, and the columns are the features, the flow based features. And the yellow color means that all the feature values for that particular malware category and for that feature all the feature values are different, while the blue color means that the features are the same. So as you can see here, it might be even 
quite hard to actually train one classifier for one specific malware category, not mentioning one classifier that will be detecting all of the categories. So we have to come up with something else and that is the back-based approach. So what we do, we take the incoming connections and we group them into bags. And one bag is basically a set of connections from one user to one domain or one server IP. So it describes the communication between a user and a domain in time. And we can extract very interesting features out of that which can be then put into the classifier and this such classifier uh, would be able to detect a reasonable amount of variety of, of malware samples. Here you can see uh, examples of far malicious bags and one legitimate bag. And I hope you can't see the individual characters because then you would be focusing on the flow based features and that's what we are trying to avoid. But if you have a look at it from the distance, you would see that the URLs within each malware bag have similar structure. They are not the same, but almost the same. There is a change here and there, but as opposed to the, they have the similar structure, as opposed to the legitimate bag, because if you are visiting some legitimate site, then you are downloading a set of images and iframes and JavaScript, so the URLs look completely different. And this is exactly the thing that we are trying to capture here in the representation, the malware dynamics. So we got inspired from the action recognition where you have a sequence of images and you want to detect some actions. So for us, flows are the images. One flow is one image and the back, the whole communication is the video. So we are trying to actually recognize malware videos from the background. So here you can see the overview and I'm not going to go into the details, uh, but we start with the initial uh, connections, we group them into the bags, extract the basic features I was talking about and then we take for every feature, we take all the feature values for all the flows within a bag and compute different self simulatory matrices and then we convert them into uh, the histograms to increase the invariance and finally we combine everything into one feature vector and apply our optimization algorithm that would actually learn all the parameters, for example the number of bins or the bin widths and everything that will learn all of these automatically from the data. So the representation would be specifically tuned data tuned to the malware samples. And if you are in more interested into that, please have a look into our Usenix security paper from this year. So that was the first challenge, how to capture the malware dynamics and how to make a representation that would be, that would be uh, ideal for, for this problem. Another problem is the mistakes in labels. Because what we typically have is a small amount of reliable labels. Mo basically most reliable are the labels that are uh, manually created, right? But this is, this does not scale. So for example we all know that Mr. Yoda is a good guy, right? But what about the rest? Well for the rest we can see, we can use other sources, for example blacklist or feeds that are not that reliable and label the remaining connections or the remaining network traffic. But the question is whether there will be some other mistakes and there will be, right? So if we can actually use it for training a robust and reliable classifier. And we believe that if you would use the traditional approach, it's not possible because the classification model would be too polluted with the mistakes. So instead, we suggest to use a different technique which is called multiple instance learning approach which can actually handle these types of mistakes and I'm going to show you just the idea. So at the beginning, we have a set of connections that are those uh, r black lines and they are, are either legitimate or malicious. So if the connection is legitimate, then 
uh, there is the green minus sign if the connection is malicious then it is denoted with the red plus sign. But we don't know the true label so we apply blacklists or feeds or whatever is available and label the connections. And as I said there will be some mistakes, right? So if there is the M in, that means that for example legitimate flow is classified as malicious or vice versa. And if you put, put it like this into the classifier you can expect that the classifier will be behaving poorly because of the polluted model. Because you will be forcing him to send, to adjust some kind of hyperplanes uh, in the space where it, it shouldn't be. But instead, if you use the back approach and combine the individual flows into backs and label the backs, then you have the ability to dramatically reduce this negative effect. And it has two advantages. First, you don't need to label everything you don't need to label each individual flow you just need to label the bags. And the bags could be everything let's say the, all the traffic from a user. If you know that the user is infected that is enough and you don't have to say specifically which flow is the one that caused that. Because the classifier would just take only a few representative and most interesting flows and put it into the model. And we, for that we have a modified SVM classifier uh, modified for, for this type of mill approach. So again if you are more interested please have a look at the our, at our ECML uh, paper. So we were kind of successful with deployment of those, tech, those back approaches and we were able to actually uh, classify a uh, nice variety of malware samples including crypto wall exploit kit or different banking trojans but Veronica will be talking about it uh, after me. Uh, so that was just the explaining of how to build a reliable representation and how to use weak labels for classification. But there is another important step and that is how to build uh, reliable classification models on the top of that. And this is something that Lukash will be talking about it right now. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. Uh, well, hello. Uh, so, uh, okay, so this is the third challenge. And uh, the question is now how to build a reliable data set uh, for training and uh, even uh, what models to use uh, in order to be capture uh, the malware. So, the first thing uh, that I will be talking about uh, is how to sample your training data to uh, get a reliable training set of your classifier. The first thing is that we uh, per day we process around 10 billion of requests which is a huge number. And in fact uh, most of or this uh, these requests cannot be fully labeled of course. Just a small portion of them can be. Another thing is that the uh, problem is very imbalanced. S uh, only some of them are malicious uh, but uh, the most of them is legitimate or benign uh, behavior. So uh, in this uh, picture you can see the green uh, red uh, circles that uh, right now represent the known legitimate samples and the bugs represent the malicious one. So if you would train a classifier you would get a, uh, end up with the boundaries depicted here. But of course uh, they are trained only on the known stuff that you have labeled. Whenever you introduce the rest uh, of, the, of the traffic you will figure out that the boundaries are in fact very very weak and that the precision of the classification goes uh, goes down. So what you can do obviously right we can use also the unlabeled uh, samples and uh, in that way strengthen the boundaries of the classification. But the question is how to do that and how to avoid the processing 10 billions of samples. So what we do uh, we have a set of statistical simple classifiers that uh, in fact uh, process the data and uh, we get a maliciousness score. Uh, we rank uh, the traffic according to the score and uh, instead of taking all the samples we take only the top end samples and uh, collect these uh, across a longer period of time to get a diverse uh, data set. In this way in fact we can get rid of uh, the benign or not interesting samples and focus only on, th on those samples uh, that are populating our uh, space of uh, interest. Another thing uh, is how to get uh, rid of uh, malicious samples in the unlabeled, uh, unlabeled set at uh, least those that mostly harm the classification. And for this reason uh, I've used the posit positive unlabeled training principle. 
Uh, that is quite simple. Uh, you take, uh, s you have a malicious, uh, labeled malicious sample set, and you take a few a small portion of samples as spies, and you inject them into uh, the, your negative training set. And then you train a binary classifier from these two sets, and then what you do, you just score your uh, unlabeled uh, data, and you will find a threshold uh, below which uh, none of the spies or the known positives occurs. Then, and in this way, uh, you can kind of discard the most problematic samples and uh, get a much more cleaner uh, negative training set. Okay, so now we have some training principles and representations. Uh, the question is what classifiers we use and uh, how we use them. Uh, so the first one is SVM, as uh, Karel was already talking about, uh, for the mill representation. Uh, but the other one that we use is random forest, a very popular technique uh, used in many state-of-the-art machine learning techniques. It has a one nice property that is randomness, and uh, we, uh, how do we use it? Is that instead of using the full feature set, or full, full features that we have, we sample only randomly a smaller subset of these features and train a specific instance of the model at a time only from this subset. Whenever the model is retrained, it uses again another uh, random subset of the features. So, uh, therefore, the trader cannot be sure exactly what kind of features we are using at the moment. And uh, we use it prevalently for uh, per vector classification. Uh, what I mean by that is, for example, that uh, if we want to detect or uh, use uh, uh, communication using a DGA, then we can extract single feature vector from the domain name, and we can assign directly a label to this single feature vector. So it's just a single feature vector uh, uh, classification. However, in that case, of course, you need labels on the level of individual vectors, which is quite expensive and uh, often not possible. Therefore, other principles we use are neural networks. Again, uh, there are a lot of different uh, architectures uh, that uh, can be uh, used. Uh, but uh, we use the specific architecture, and the classification right now is performed on the level of users, not on the level of vectors. And how we do that is uh, depicted here. So we have a traffic of user J. Smith. Uh, he has several requests, for example, going to Google, Gmail, uh, some uh, raw IP, and CNN, and so on. We can extract uh, feature vectors or representations that Carol was talking about for each of these requests. What we do is then that we propagate all these feature vectors related to full traffic to the first hidden layer uh, in the neural network already trained. So, so that means that now we come up uh, with a new representation and uh, we got this new representation again for each single request. And what we do next is we do pooling, a very uh, common in convolutional neural networks. And the pooling uh, is in fact an aggregation where we aggregate all the feature vectors uh, go, uh, related to uh, one host name or one domain name. So at the first hidden layer, we now get uh, one feature vector for Google, for one feature vector for Gmail, and so on. So these feature vectors kind of depict the communication of the user going to uh, these domains. Then we propagate all these feature vectors next to the second hidden layer, and again we do the pooling, and we get up with a feature vector representing the full uh, traffic of user J. Smith. And finally, to be able to get a classification score, uh, we propagate the feature vector to the third hidden layer, and we get a classification score, and this is just compared to a threshold, and then uh, if higher than, uh, alarm is uh, uh, well triggered. So this is how we c classify uh, uh, user traffic and how we uh, use the context. Okay, so we have a few classifiers. Now the question is how does the uh, classification topology look like? The first thing is that the classifiers have to see all the traffic or classify every, every traffic, so all the 10 billion requests. And this is quite time consuming. Therefore, we use uh, first just a pre filtering layer, which is also a classifier, a data driven classifier, but it uses just a simple features that can be extracted quite simply. And uh, then at uh, other levels, we can use more advanced techniques and more advanced feature vectors. So, for example, you can see here uh, the traffic that is. Uh, filtered uh, by the first layer, and it can contain also false positives or false detections, but it's just the first layer, and the, uh, it should, should just filter out uh, ordinary benign traffic. So at the next level, uh, what we have here uh, is a set of classifiers, uh, which can be quite generic. Uh, they are, for example, in this case, uh, we can detect DGAs or communication uh, using domain generation algorithms, or we can uh, detect obfuscated URLs. These detectors or classifiers are already uh, highly precise, so they can distinguish easily between malicious and legitimate communication, uh, but they don't give you any uh, higher overview of what is going on there, and therefore we have the last uh, level, 
uh, where we have specific classifiers focusing directly on uh, specific malware communication such as phishing, click for and uh, click fraud or CNC communication. And uh, when you follow the classification path, you can also say, okay, this was a uh, CNC communication with a domain generation algorithm and uh, also uh, using obfuscated URLs. So this kind of information that you get from, from the uh, full classification uh, architecture. So this was the third challenge and uh, now we have also the models, we have the architecture and the question is where to, where to get the labels, how to update the labels and even how to update the whole system when uh, something changes. So the first uh, very important module is the active learning module. Uh, it consists of a human analyst. The input to the module are detections. Uh, these detections are coming from the general classifiers and all the classifiers in fact that we have. And the uh, role of the human analysts is uh, analyze or, and confirm the maliciousness of uh, the provided samples but also uh, to categorize these samples into specific categories such as click fraud, data exfiltration, ad injector and so on if uh, this is possible. The role is not to fully label every detection but uh, just uh, those representative samples uh, that are most in most uh, mostly interesting for the classifier. For example, those that lie on the uh, de decision boundaries of uh, each classifier. Uh, so let's have a look uh, on uh, how does the uh, loop or classification architecture looks like uh, now. Uh, we have the classification module where are the general classifiers, they produce detections, they go to the active learning uh, module and from the active learning module we can just easily uh, close the loop and uh, return the feedback from the human analyst uh, to the classification module. Right now we have also the categorical labels therefore we can train not only binary classifiers anymore but we train a directly uh, multi-class classifier that uh, output information on what kind of malicious behavior it was. And again, along with the general classifiers, uh, they produce detections that go to the active learning and uh, this is how we close the loop. Uh, in order to train the models, we use uh, mainly uh, Spark, uh, but not, uh, not only Spark, but many Spark and to retrain the models takes around one to two days on a 200 CPUs cluster and on uh, tens of millions of uh, samples. Okay, and uh, just in summary, okay, so we defined the automatic retraining loop and now from the time perspective, how does it look like? Now at each point, each point on the time axis uh, represents a situation where we got new samples uh, or new, sorry, new labels from the active learning module. Whenever we got them, we can retrain the model uh, or train a new model and store the model. But at the same time, uh, we already, uh, back in time, we already did that and we already had some models trained. So uh, these models are already running uh, on the same data and we can just uh, update their statistics in form of precision uh, on and accuracy how they, uh, how well they perform uh, given the new uh, labels from, from the uh, activ activity learning module. And in this way, uh, we can just easily pick any best working model at a given time and uh, use the model in the production environment and at the same time uh, we just uh, control or we just store all the updated results of each individual models and whenever something goes wrong we just can easily return to any model that uh, behaves uh, still uh, the best. Uh, well and uh, now this is the end of the theory and I give back word to Veronica and she will show you some real examples. Thank you. So, um, back to reality. <laughs> um, the interesting thing, so we saw how to go from this, right, to this. And for a threat analyst, this is huge already because it saves a lot of time, believe me. So, um, right now I'm going to show you some examples of these groups and what did we actually find with these, all these tools and uh, algorithms. So the first example is going to be about DNS changer. And no, it's not the old DNS changer, it's a new one. So um, uh, back in beginning of the year, we deployed a new uh, multi-instance learning classifier that was training in hundreds of different malware behaviors. And as usual, we were so eager to know how it performed. So 
When I do analysis, I usually group coherent behaviors because analyzing flow by flow is too time consuming. So I took all the incidents generated by this uh, meal classifier, that's the orange, and I start grouping things together and say, okay, which group is more interesting to look at? And that was the yellow one. So when I look into it, into the flows, which is the source, <coughs> source of truth, um, the URL looks like this. And it's not straightforward that it's malicious. It's uh, quite interesting though. So we start looking into a bit more deeply into this. Um, it was, there are many interesting uh, features in here. Basically the, the domains were changing. The URL was not encoded in any known encoding scheme. Uh, so it was, it was uh, quite interesting. Another factor was that suddenly in the first week we saw a spike of uh, from zero to 500 users infected, which for malware is not so common. So we were kind of reluctant to believe uh, this. Um, one of, we've managed to get one sample because, uh, one binary, because we look at the network and sometimes it's very hard to actually get the malicious binary that generate the traffic. In this case, we found it and thanks to uh, our colleague Ross Hib, he did the reverse engineering and he found that this uh, small Trojan was a DNS changer Trojan. And the communication that we were seeing, it was actually the common and contra communication. And in those long URL, it was sending a lot of information about the user. But it didn't end there because, well, the DNS changer torsion, for those uh, who don't know, is uh, basically doing something very small and very simple that is changing the, changing the name servers of your computer. It basically means when you try to go to Google, you ask for an IP, it, your name server will return you an IP. In this case, because the name servers were compromised, if you want to visit Google, you will get a malicious IP and then uh, they can do anything, return you a web page with infected uh, code and so on and so on. So we started looking at this, uh, how the users got infected with this. Um, thanks to the reverse engineering, we found that this was actually delivered by an another Trojan that was called Mamba. Um, Mamba is a Python uh, malware that has uh, basically can update itself. Uh, so the first stage was um, uh, once it was deployed, then it will download uh, from a file server another version of itself, and then it will download um, uh, the DNS changer Trojan. And we went one step further and we start correlating this with, okay, how did the users actually got infected with uh, this Mamba Trojan? And we found that most of the infections we couldn't prove completely. Uh, we are still working on that, but there was a strong correlation, meaning out of 10 infections, nine were having uh, other infections like Optimizer Pro installed on the system. And actually in the communication of the DNS changer uh, um, Trojan, we saw uh, the malware reporting these names of adware uh, to the command and control. So this was one of the first findings. And uh, this is how, in summary, very constrained, the command and control looks like. So you can see how is the malware is changing the domains, right? Also changing the IPs and also changing the URLs. But there are some things that, as we saw in the beginning of the talks, are kind of invariant. In this case, it's a path and some parameter names. Uh, which some of them are also changing because we have A and Q at the beginning. Um, so this is why uh, these algorithms are good at. So they can actually be smart and say, okay, this looks different, but actually they look the same, right? So they can do that for us. It was quite interesting. Another case that we are still investigating, we found a couple of months ago, um, is uh, it's very curious. Uh, it's about advertising gone rogue. Um, we found this traffic in the network. And this is, looks at first sight very malicious. Um, it's DGA domains, uh, random path or resources, uh, random parameter names, which actually point to the same type of uh, content, like the refer, doesn't say refer, but it says some random parameter names. So we start digging into this. And 
we actually found a different behavior related to this traffic, and it's actually that after some time they were downloading some flash file, which uh, thanks to our, also our colleague Ross Gibb, and we also have a second opinion from our colleagues in Avast. Uh, it's not malicious by itself, it's not an exploit, but it may be part of the re-exploit uh, infection uh, chain, as because this, is, this flash file is really small. It contains fingerprinting logic, basically getting information from your computer, what, what use, system you have installed, etc. So, um, and in at least one couple of cases that we can reproduce, we actually got exploited by, uh, by this re-exploit and dropping the Hansitor uh, dropper. So um, I went further because I wanted to know, um, sorry, uh, uh, another note to, to note in this slide is that all the strings in this flash file and also other communication of this uh, traffic, we found that references to popads.net. That's where the part of the advertising comes in. So I was investigating and say, okay, but this is advertising, is, is this is supposed to be legitimate or, or not? So um, I actually did a mapping of the infrastructure to try to understand if this is a systematic way of doing this or not. So I, I map all the host names and how long they were active. And actually, I hope you see the animation. This is, this is the host names and how long they are active. And you can see that it's reducing and they are changing a lot almost in the end they are active for only one day and they just go offline. And this is supposed to be legitimate advertising, which I don't think so. So um, uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to, to talk about uh, to finish is once uh, as a threat hunter, uh, once you find something, which is super cool, uh, you are done, you want to move on, right? You don't want to be maintaining the ISC's list of the same malware over and over, you are stuck with that, so it's not, it's not fun. So um, uh, how, how we can mix all these things together? We already saw that we can actually train very specific classifiers, right? So what if the algorithms can take care of this tracking and not me? That can be great. So this is what we did and put in place. And basically, uh, the yellow is uh, the initial set of IOCs, which was around a dozen uh, host names, and this is kind of the size of the infections. And the yellow is the initial thing that we use for training, to say, okay, the algorithm, please learn this, okay? Um, please learn this, that I want to track it. Um, then we deploy the classifier, you can see the blue. Um, after some time, uh, the classifier is able to actually uh, start generating incidents on base of this behavior, based, in, based on this behavior, completely alone, and it's much more uh, than we actually uh, could capture with the initial IOCs, right? So actually, three more times more uh, detections, and didn't require me any type of interaction, which is great. Um, so we are doing this with more than 100 campaigns, and it's, uh, it's very useful because actually the, you can have the experts focusing on what matters the most, which is actually finding new things, and leave the maintenance for the, for the machines. So, to conclude, uh, we presented how we, we can create models that are invariant to this uh, network traffic changes, which is very important to capture all this dynamic behavior of malware. We, we also presented how we can use these weak labels, whether it's feeds, blacklist, anything that is, sometimes they are very good, sometimes that they are not so reliable, and we can use these to learn at large scale. And we can also show, we also show how we use active learning to actually automatically train, uh, track malware. And uh, we use this, uh, as we say in the beginning, we, we uh, are using this combination of things in uh, real life. And, and more in networks covering in total more than a million users and finding tens of thousands of infections. And this is good news and bad news. The bad news is that these tens of thousands of infections 
are infections that bypass everything we have in place right now. Because you have to have in place everything, but you can also do this uh, finding infections after, like threat hunting. So um, this leaves us with this, that what got us here won't get us there, right? We have IDSs, we have antiviruses, we have everything. And it's great, we should keep keep those, but we should also think about the future and how we start mixing all these techniques together because we can do much more and we should. And this is why uh, we are here today talking about this. So thank you. I think we have time for questions, if anyone has questions. No questions? Oh, over there? Oh, okay. Say the classifier was based on one label. So if you give it a sort of blood shock, if you know what blood shock it looks like, it's sort of doing sort of normal infection. Uh yeah, so I mean <coughs> the number of samples, right, for training, how many samples we can in fact use and and to train a reliable system. Uh that depends, right? Uh Depends how the sample looks like or how diverse it is or how different it is from the rest of the traffic. So of course we can, even for just singles of uh, samples, train a reliable classifier, but it's not almost the case. It's just strongly depends. But still, uh, we just, uh, what, what we do, we, everything we have, uh, maybe just one sample, we train the model still, and what we do, we just re-evaluate it and, uh, over the time, whenever new labels are uh, available, and when we see that it behaves correctly, then it is deployed, right? But this is done automatically. You don't have to care. You just use it, train it, sh uh, see that it works, and deploy. Any other questions? Okay. Are there any other cases that you've uh, tested this out on beyond using uh, GTA analytics? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. We have a kind of a lot of classifiers. It was just for illustration because there are the most cases or the one that uh, people know. But we have around uh, 70 different classifiers, small classifiers, uh, classifying generic behavior. And then the, these, are, these are then combined into these categories. And we have around 20 or 30 different malware categories uh, that we can classify right now as ad injector, ransomware, exfiltration, and so on. And they are still increasing. Yeah, so definitely more. Yeah. Did you deal with other protocols for Um right now we are using mainly proxy logs, which that uh restricts many things, but we already started to work to move these techniques to NetFlow which will give us more uh, insight on other protocols. But we, d we don't have any results yet on that. Any other question that I'm not seeing? Yeah? When you said uh, what got us here won't get us there. Yeah. What do you imply that you need the threat uh, hunting? That's the message. Uh, I think that I think that we should uh, be more bold and um, start combining things in a different way, shaking things up, because uh, we have in place many traditional things and many people, right now there are hundreds of companies saying we do machine learning, but it's not only about machine learning. We only can catch, we work on the network, so we already we are, we, you are already infected if we see the traffic, right? So it's, uh, it's n I mean in the sense that anything, uh, so far we have this unique product that will protect you from everything and it's not the, this is not going to work. It doesn't work right now, it doesn't work, it's not going to work in five years. So we need to, to change things up. So start thinking security differently. Uh, okay, no more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.